The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Impact Investing and Private Foundations, New Guidance from the IRS and its Implications for the Field. This is a joint effort of Mission Investors Exchange and the Council on Foundations, and we're pleased to be presenting uh, Josh Mint, Tomer Inbar, Matt Onik, and Ruth Madrigal is on the phone with us. Thanks to the over 400 people who are joining us today on the web platform, in particular our audience here in Atlanta, where this webinar is integrated into the Mission Investing Institute, taking place now at the Healthcare Georgia Foundation. We're also broadcasting from Boston, New York, Washington, D.C., and Park City, Utah. And you can follow countless others on Twitter through the impact investing hashtag IMPIND. This is a moderated conversation rather than a presentation. We invite you to play a part by adding your own questions. You can do that by clicking on the questions tab on the right-hand panel on your screen and typing your questions for the panelists all throughout the webinar. We'll weave them into the content as we can and reserve some time at the end to take others. Please include your name and organization name when you submit a question. If you experience difficulty, select the help option at the top of the GoToWebinar navigation panel for assistance. If you're unable to access this panel, you may dial into the Council on Foundations office for technical assistance or email membership at cof.org. This webinar is being voice recorded and a link to the podcast will be emailed to all registrants and will be available on the Mission Investors Exchange and the Council on Foundations website. You'll also be receiving a notice about the Council on Foundations Endowment Management and Finance Summit taking place in New York on November 5th and 6th, and there will be three sessions focused on impact investing there. Speaker bios and other handouts are available by clicking on the Handouts tab in the panel on the right-hand side of your screen and downloading those documents. Mission Investors Exchange is a network of over 250 foundations and affiliate organizations that provides education and tools to enable foundations to build and expand their impact investing programs, as well as a public policy and influence voice in the field. The Mission Investors Exchange CEO, Matt Onik, is our moderator today. The webinar will now begin. Please take it away, Matt Onik. Thank you, Melanie. We had some very exciting news out of Treasury just a few weeks ago. A notice was issued that clarifies that private foundations can align their investment activities with their charitable purpose or mission when part of a prudent investment policy. I'm excited to have a, an esteemed panel uh, here today to be able to talk about this exciting news. To be more specific, the notice states that private foundations exercising ordinary business care and prudence can make an investment that furthers the foundation's charitable purpose at an expected rate of return that is less than what the foundation might obtain from an investment that is not related to its charitable purpose. For example, one that might be below market rate. It is important to note that this guidance does not touch on the regulations around program-related investing, but rather other types of impact investing that do not qualify as PRIs. And our panelists will go into this in greater detail in a moment. The guidance does at least two important things. First, for foundations already making these types of investments, this clarification may give them a little more comfort and eliminate any ambiguity about their ability to take into account their mission when making individual investment decisions. Second, for foundations new to mission investing or contemplating new avenues for their impact investing work, this guidance eliminates a perceived barrier that might have shut down the discussion about mission before it even started. For these foundations, a door may now be open. Even more importantly, from the sector-wide perspective, this guidance brings the mission conversation into the mainstream and adds to the growing chorus that mission investing is here to stay. It further legitimizes mission investing as a tool that foundations can use to further their impact as part of a balanced and reasoned investment policy. I now am excited to speak with our panelists who can explain the guidance in greater detail, explain what it does and doesn't say, and how it may impact the field going forward. 
I will uh, briefly introduce our three panelists and then uh, speak to them in a conversation manner as well as take uh, questions from all of you uh, on the webinar. First, we have Ruth Madrigal, who is attorney advisor in the Office of Tax Policy at the Department of Treasury and who led the work on this new notice. She is a lead's work on all tax matters involving tax-exempt organizations, including charities and their donors. Tomer Imbar is partner at Patterson, Belknap, Webb, and Tyler. He represents tax-exempt organizations in a broad range of structural and operating matters, and his clients include public charities, private foundations, and colleges and universities, among others. And finally, we have Josh Mintz, who is Vice President and General Counsel of the MacArthur Foundation, and he is responsible for their overall legal affairs, as well as advising the President on policy matters and strategic direction. Josh is also a member of the Board of Directors of the Council on Foundations. So Ruth, I would love to start with you um, and start off with a very basic question, which is what does this guidance actually say? Well, hi, and thank you for having me. I, I'm very, very pleased to be here and talking with you all today. Um, this guidance, as, as Matt said, uh, provides the that um, foundations that are using CARE can make investments that further the charitable purposes as well as make a good uh, financial return. Um, more specifically, it says that private foundations can take their mission, can take their, their purposes into account when the managers are prudently making decisions about what investments they should make. Uh, they, the notice says specifically that the foundation managers may consider all relevant facts and circumstances, including the relationship between a particular investment and the foundation's charitable purpose. Um, and this is important because the regulations which were written back in the early 1970s really weren't contemplating the world that we're living in now. They, they talk about good, safe investments and bad, risky investments to some extent. And when they talk about managers considering factors when making prudent decisions, they talk about considering factors such as the rate of return, uh, the impact of inflation, uh, the need to have a diversified portfolio. And while all of those, those elements are uh, true considerations and are considerations that any prudent manager would take into account when they're making investment decisions, I think in a, in a growing way over especially the last decade, private foundation managers are also thinking when they're making investment decisions, how do my investment decisions relate to my charitable purpose? If I'm an environmental foundation and I'm making a lot of grants to deal with um, uh, benefiting the environment in some way or combating greenhouse gases, when I'm investing, do I want to be investing in Exxon? Or th those sorts of questions are, are, I think, being raised more and more. And so this guidance says specifically you can consider this relationship between the investment and charitable purposes in addition to the financial factors. And if an investment furthers the, fi the private foundation's charitable purposes, maybe a lot, maybe a little, it doesn't specify a particular quantum, but you can take into account that mission or social return. And a manager, when they're prudently weighing up their investment options, can trade off financial return and social mission return. Uh, the guidance says clearly that foundation managers are not required to select only investments that offer the highest rates of return, the lowest risks, or the greatest liquidity, so long as they're exercising their ordinary business care and prudence when they're making their decisions. Excellent. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Tomer, let me move to you for a moment. Um, how do you uh, think this guidance will impact foundations, uh, uh, both those who are currently uh, making mission investments and those that may be contemplating doing so in the future? Sure. And um, first, I would like to say thank you to Ruth and her colleagues for for working on this and recognizing that 
Um, many in the sector had asked these questions, and responding to that was, I, I think, very beneficial to the sector. Um, to, to the issue of how it impacts foundations, I think there are a couple of ways to think about it. That um, folks who are who are interested in doing mission-related investments and incorporating mission into their investment portfolio, they now can look at the the federal law and the state law and think of prudence in a more kind of a harmonized way. That historically, because of to Ruth's point, historically because of the the language that we had um, in Section 4944 of the Code regarding jeopardizing investments, there was a bit of a mismatch between what fiduciaries thought of as their obligations under state law and then perhaps something different under federal law. Now, I'm not sure that was intentional or more a factor of uh, sort of a, a product of the fact that time had times have changed to Ruth's point. But in the end, what this does, it essentially says that um, as you think of prudence, you can make those decisions in a way you're comfortable and in a way that you've been doing it. With respect to incorporating mission, I like to think about it that you, you, if you're giving something up, you want to get something in return. And as you, to Ruth's point of we're not specifying a quantum of mission or relatedness that you have to get in these investments, you're just making a prudent and measured decision in the context of your overall allocations and the context of how you're approaching investments. And you're making a determination that this investment is good for lots of different reasons, including because it furthers our the mission and charitable purposes of our foundation. So hopefully what we'd like to see is as people consider mission-related investing as another tool to complement their other forms of achieving their charitable purposes, that they will look at this and, and incorporate it in the right way and put it in the right bucket, think about the investments that will really further their exam purposes in different ways those that will make them money, those that might make them a little less money but gain them a lot of impact and so on and so forth, and to think about these things along a continuum. Great. Ruth, let me, let me go back to you for a minute, and maybe you can talk a little bit about what the guidance doesn't touch on, and in particular uh, how the regulations around program-related investments are not touched by uh, this notice. Sure. Um, Right. This guidance doesn't say anything really about program-related investments or PRIs, as we call them in the tax world, for those of you who are not tax geeks. Um, and it doesn't change the duties that uh, uh, managers have. Private foundation managers have a duty to use uh, prudence, ordinary business care and prudence when they're making their decisions about investing. This doesn't really change that, and it doesn't change the rules. For PRIs, um, just a review for some of you, a PRI is an investment that has, it, it meets three, three tests, the three prong test. First, it has to be made primarily for charitable purposes. And this is a pretty good bar. It, it means that investment would not, it, it, it significantly furthers your charitable purposes and it wouldn't have been made but for that relationship with your charitable purposes. But also, it has no significant purpose of making money. So if you're doing it and you're wanting to make good money at it, as well as doing charitable things, it, it may not be a PRI. If, it, if there's a significant money-making purpose, you won't meet that second prong. And then third is no lobbying or political activity as a purpose. These PRIs, they're, they're they have some extra tax benefits. They're treated as a grant alternative in, in some ways under the code. For example, they count as qualifying distributions for private foundations for meeting their 5% their payout. And this notice doesn't touch PRIs. This talks about investments that are not PRIs, but what are they? Because the code and the regulations don't talk about this full range of investments that are not, not program-related investments, but maybe don't achieve the maximal financial return. This uh, notice is talking about uh, investments that might get some sort of social return. So it might further your purpose in some way, but these investments wouldn't get the benefits of PRIs primarily because they're not meeting the same sort of threshold for charitability that PRIs meet. 
and because they get a financial benefit. Uh, PRIs aren't, aren't getting as much of a financial benefit, and so there's some tax benefits there to make up for that. But, uh, so that's the relationship between this notice and, and PRIs. Uh, primarily, it's, they're, they're addressing two different kinds of investments. Great. Tomer, maybe you can talk a little bit about how this, this could open a door for folks who in the past might have uh, seen uh, when the word mission came up in terms of their investments, that kind of stopped the conversation and they weren't willing to go forward and think about how to tie mission to their investment policy. I think, Matt, to something you said earlier that, that one, of the, one of the good things about this notice is that it it, it puts it, um, it raises the dialogue a bit that historically, again, um, and again, going back to the way people used to think of the dichotomy between mission and um, investment return, where that shifted over time, but there's still a sense that mission is not, an, that for, from a fiduciary perspective, mission is not something that necessarily should be incorporated into an investment decision. That's not the way many people think about it, but there are some out there who still do think about it that way. And what I think this does by, by taking off the table a question of at the federal level that perhaps there's a different standard of prudence that is only focused on monetary return, and by aligning that with where we've evolved to under state law, under UPMIFA, that you can take into consideration as part of a prudence analysis the the relative of the relationship between an asset and the and the mission or the charitable purposes of an entity, then it allows for that conversation to happen in a more rational way. That people can now say, is this the right thing for our foundation? Do we want to do this? Um, how would we do it? And what are the criteria that we are looking at when we think about the mission we're buying when we take maybe take less of a return on an investment? Or what are we looking for in our mission or impact investments? And how do we monitor those things? And how do we think about them? And so I think from, from that perspective, it allows, it allows folks to, um, to really engage in that conversation, hopefully. And it's further evidence that times are changing a bit. Um, with the recent White House announcement, with this, with even with our sort of the regulations on, on PRIs, even though this isn't about PRIs, there is a lot of conversation going on now about how to use investment vehicles to accomplish charitable purposes. And I think this helps that because it's, again, another tool for foundations to, to look to, to find out how they can impact the world in a manner consistent with what they do generally on the grant making side and elsewhere. Thanks, Josh. I uh, wanted to pull you in and, and given your experience at MacArthur, um, obviously you uh, have had a robust uh, mission investing or program related investing program and have a lot of experience in this space. Uh, based on that experience, how do you think this guidance will help smaller foundations or foundations new to mission investing uh, move into the field? Thanks, Matt. I think that in, in general, you know, this guidance is very helpful because anytime the IRS speaks and provides for its perspective, it's good for the field. I don't really have a good feel, frankly, about the smaller foundations in terms of what might have been holding them back. From my perspective, and I think the perspective of a lot of my colleagues at larger foundations, and I think a lot of outside counsel, this announcement, while very helpful and important, did not change the way that many people had looked at this set of issues. In other words, I think there was a feeling among sophisticated practitioners and some of the larger foundations that you could take into account mission. Uh, when you're looking at an investment, you had to be prudent, as Ruth indicated. You had to look at the relevant state statutes, uh, primarily Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, which gives a series of criteria to consider. And you had to exercise that duty and of uh, prudence in looking at all the factors. I think that there was a lot of confusion over the years in terms of whether any degree of mission creeping into the investment side of the house would be problematic. And I think there probably were smaller foundations or organizations that didn't have the resources that were confused or perhaps restrained by the fact that there wasn't clear guidance about the ability to take mission into effect. So I think as Tomer indicated, you know, and as most of the panel knows, and I'm sure many people on this webinar, you know, there's been uh, a, a 
substantial movement towards taking mission into account in a variety of ways. Foundations handle them in very different ways. When we look at our impact investment, investments, and we had primarily been uh, doing program-related investments, we did get authority from our board several years ago to do mission-related investments. Even the vocabulary is confusing for people. As Ruth indicated, you think about it and say, okay, we know what a PRI is. That's statutorily mandated by 4944. We know how we can make investments in the investment portfolio, but even the language about mission-related investments or investments related to programs or other language I think has confused people. So I think this announcement is combined with the other things that have occurred, the new examples in the PRI rules, a lot of the work that's being done by the ABA and other folks is really, I think, great, creating greater clarity. It's not to say, however, though, that this is just a panacea that says, okay, any foundation can go out and start to make mission-related investments. I think the key, and Tomer alludes to this in a very helpful blog post, is that you have to have a carefully thought out process. You have to, should have, I think, a policy statement that addresses how you're going to use this tool. And I think you have to still engage in a very thoughtful process in terms of understanding all the factors at play in a given decision. From MacArthur's standpoint, we're program first in our impact investment. So we're always looking at this in terms of how is it going to further our program. Other foundations might look at it and weigh those aspects differently. So in, in some, I think it's a very helpful development. I wouldn't identify it as a kind of panacea or an excuse to plow head first into something. You still need to exercise care and prudence in making these decisions. Wonderful. Um, Tomer, it sounds like you wanted to, to hop in. Yeah, because I, I, I think the point Josh made is a very good one in that um, there's no real silver silver bullet here except fidelity to to mission, fiduciary duty, and what makes the most sense for the organization. That when we think about mission investing, it, it's it's actually difficult stuff because you're looking at on the program related investing side, it's hard, but you you really see these things as definitely charitable. Um, when we're talking about mission investing, now we're looking to Ruth's point earlier, probably along a continuum of, of potentially prudent investments that have differing degrees of mission impact that flow from them. And making a determination about what's the right amount of impact for a foundation, what is the right direction to go in, taking into consideration its other needs, namely the returns to fund grant making programs, direct charitable activities, PRIs, et cetera, et cetera, that it becomes a, a a, a good and tough conversation, I think one that's fruitful to have and necessary to have, particularly in our environment, but, but thinking about it in that way from what are your responsibilities here? I think what the notice does is it reiterates that those basic things, this, this notion of prudence and prudence is a varied and nuanced um, um, concept as it relates to the federal um, policing of this piece, because again, the state, the state part still exists and is separate, but aligning the two now helps boards and, and program staff to look at these things in the context of what they're doing, not worrying that there are two different masters they have to worry about, not to Josh's point, yes, we might think this way, but now it's clear we don't have to, we can, we, we can sort of put it aside and just go about the business of doing the investing, the mission impact um, focus, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I think that's from a dialogue standpoint and the ability to put people um, into the right trajectory as they think about mission investing, I think that's a very helpful outcome of this. Yeah, and Ruth, I can I'd chime like in to, here. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, Matt. Go ahead, Ruth. Maybe I can chime in here as well and agree that uh, with what Tomer said earlier about uh, there being a number of administration uh, activities around impact investing. Um, and, and again, this is a hard concept to wrap your head around because, as I think I said earlier, it's a wide range of investments here that are, are pretty fairly well undefined that range from everything uh, from a social screen, a very basic social screen that I'm not going to invest in X that is contrary to my mission to actively seeking out investment opportunities that may significantly further uh, your mission. There's a whole range of activities there. And I think the administration uh, and various parts of the administration have been exploring for some time this notion of uh, supporting private foundations 
in utilizing all of their assets and, and freeing them to, to use all of their assets to accomplish their purposes. And this guidance isn't about telling you what to do or what not to do with your, uh, with your uh, endowment or with your investing policies, but it is an attempt to, to let you know that we're not in the way of you making prudent decisions uh, that can span the whole range of different investments. Ruth, um, folks have, have alluded to the PRI guidance uh, the, the, or the examples, uh, additional examples on program-related investing that came out a few years ago. Could you maybe walk us through um, what led you to put out the PRI guidance and then in turn what led you to put out this notice? Sure, uh, because they are very much related. Uh, back in 2012, we issued some proposed regulations uh, around PRIs. What those regulations did was not so much change the rules for PRIs, they didn't make any changes, but they did add about 10 new examples of, uh, of what a good PRI might look like. And that was necessary because in the uh, existing regs, there were a number of examples, but they were all, uh, or pretty much all, around one type of charitable purpose, and they were all set in the United States, and they, they used a limited range of investment vehicles. And we had gotten a number of comments from the field. Um, and MacArthur Foundation, for example, was very instrumental in trying, and, and the ABA and, and a number of different groups in giving us some examples of modern PRIs situations that folks are doing now that were not captured in the regs, but that folks were, were running into either problems because to get comfortable with doing it, they would have to go get an expensive uh, opinion of counsel, or they were just a little bit shaky not having seen anything in writing saying that it was okay. And so there was a barrier uh, for people getting involved in some PRIs. Uh, what we did was we issued a bunch of new examples that illustrate how a range of investment techniques can be employed as PRIs. We illustrated that PRIs can be made in a wide variety of situations to accomplish a wide variety of charitable purposes. We illustrated that you can use them internationally as well as domestically. Um, and, and so we put those out there and we made those those proposed regs, we took an unusual step to allow foundations to rely on those currently, even though we haven't finalized uh, those regs and the IRS can't use them against anyone. We're taking comments and we, we have on our current uh, priority guidance plan an intention to finalize those regs, but private foundations have been able to rely on those examples to make PRIs and feel comfortable making PRIs since they were issued in 2012. We got a lot of comments on those regulations. I know Council on Foundations and a number of foundations and others commented on those regs and that's really helpful. You should also note, note that at the very beginning of this project, it was the comments from the field that started us thinking about PRIs and the need to issue those proposed rules to begin with. Um, but some commenters pointed out that this is great, this is really helpful in making PRIs and being able to do them without the tax compliance costs that perhaps existed. But they said, but what about other investments? And I ran into, in a number of cases, as I was talking to folks about PRIs, folks would say, yeah, that's great, but what if I've got an investment that looks great? It, 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 fully accomplishes my charitable purposes. I, I have no doubt that this is really a, a great thing for the charitable outcomes. But you know, it's going to make some good money. It may not make it as fast as uh, some of the, the some other investments, but it. I want to make this in order to make money as well. And that kicks it out of the PRI bucket if you've got a significant purpose of making money too. Um, and uh, Rob Collier and the Council on Michigan Foundations have been sort of tireless in, in being vocal on this issue 
to us and the IRS and, and indicating that there's a need for guidance here because as they were uh, working in, in Michigan and Detroit, they, they were running up against foundation managers that were, were looking at development opportunities and opportunities to be making investments in communities there and being told from a program perspective, this is great. From a legal perspective, this is not a PRI. I'm sorry you can't do it. And then going to their investment folks and hearing, yeah, it makes, it makes a good return, but it doesn't make as good a return as what we can get you on these other investments. And our, our, our duty needs to be to maximize returns, is what these managers were hearing from investment folks. And so they were kind of stuck looking at investments that were great on a, on a social return and charitable return perspective and, and good on a, on a financial return perspective and being told from both sides of the house they couldn't do it. And that's where this guidance, I think, comes in. It gives foundation managers a piece of paper that says, yes, you can consider both the financial return and the mission return, the, the charitable return, when you're deciding what investments to make. Great, and, and I was um, at Mission Investors Exchange's Mission Investing Institute yesterday in Atlanta, and particularly for folks who have not uh, been able to make mission invest in investments in their foundations, I think this concept of having a piece of paper that they could shake and that they could share with their trustees who may have in the past simply said, we cannot look at any investment that isn't making a market rate return that they now have some comfort that if it's part of a broader prudent policy that they can take uh, into account investments that touch on the charitable purpose. And I think that that is why uh, we are seeing the enthusiasm in the field, particularly among those that have not been uh, participating in these types of investments in the past or have been blocked before even getting out of the gate by trustees who are nervous without having uh, that, that uh, piece of paper, as, as you mentioned. Um, Tomer, you may have, uh, in your blog post that was referenced, I think you started with finally as your first word. Um, I took that a little bit. Uh, I think that is what I heard yesterday in Atlanta from a lot of our members, again, who are new to this space or want to move into it, that finally they have this piece of paper. But maybe you can uh, expound on that. Sure. And, and again, I think that one of the themes throughout this is that there was ways to do this before. State law has done this. Sophisticated people have thought about this, and, and unsophisticated people have thought about it. Lots of people have worried. But that having always when the IRS says something, it carries weight in our sector. That when we think about language and when we think about going back to regulations, people, particularly in this space, particularly in the PRI rules and the jeopardizing investment rules, people look at, those, at the language and they read it literally sometimes, particularly if they don't practice a lot or if their investment advisors are not looking at this stuff. So the finally for me was I, you know, to, to Josh's earlier point, I, I've always wa wondered why this is taking so long. This to me is a no-brainer. And, and so having it happen and having the administration pushing in this direction that says, listen, make these decisions the way that you make your decisions generally. Why should there be a difference between public charities and private foundations on this, for example? Um, thinking about your investing, it's governed by a prudent standard to begin with under state law. It's a nuanced standard that was developed through the uniform, um, the, the uniform rules process throughout MIFA. And I think there's, there's a, that's good to have this happen. And we shouldn't have things out there that impede people for the wrong reason. Now, I think jeopardizing investments can now be used for things that are really, really, really egregious. And if you look at the language of 4944, it's about investing amounts in a manner that will jeopardize the carrying out of any of the exempt purposes of the, found, of the foundation. It's hard if you have, let's say, a $5 billion foundation to say that a 500,000 MRI will jeopardize its ability to do anything. And so I think now we can look at this big foundation, small foundation, look at investing practice through a prudent lens that, that's more nuanced, and leave 4944 for when there are egregious violations. Matt, if I can just uh, add a word, I mean, I think what's so interesting is that one of the 
beauties of our sector is the diversity diversity of approach and thinking about these issues. And you think about in your own career, and, and you look at how the growth of Mission Investors Exchange and the growth of other groups like this and Gin and Confluence and all the like. You know, mission-driven investing has been taking off for the last. You know, you can choose your time period, four, five, ten years. MacArthur did investments related to programs in the 90s, which was a pre precursor of this. So what's interesting to me is that, you know, this was being done, right, and there wasn't a pronouncement from the IRS. So there were people that were doing it. You had lots of groups, uh, Mission for Good, you know, I, I can name a lot of them that have weighed in on this and encouraged people to say, take an interpretation of this that makes sense. You've had community foundations that you know, even use the same jargon, even though 4944 by its terms, to Tomer's point, is not even applicable to them. So I think, and then you have your experience in going to your session yesterday and others who are saying, um, finally, you know, we can release the, the hounds and, every, you know, all this money is going to pour forth into the sector. I think we've seen a lot of money coming in. I think the, the, the clarity of this announcement, the, the fact that it's coming with a lot of the other things that Tomer and Ruth raised about what the White House initiatives and other efforts by lots of groups in really putting an emphasis on this, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how much it really frees people up. I'm sure there were trustees and there were lawyers who were concerned about the lack of clarity, who were looking 4944 and saying, you know what, this isn't a slam dunk. We don't have the clarity that we need. It could be a jeopardizing investment. And so that this this takes that away. But I think this movement, you know, the, the train was hurtling down the tracks, and I think this just takes up some of the, 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 perhaps the yellow caution. But I would go back to the fact that you still have to do it in a thoughtful way. You still have to think about, you know, you may want to keep a, uh, an investment portfolio geared towards a, a certain objective return. You may want to, as MacArthur does, have a separate portfolio for impact investments. There's lots of ways to come at this, but having a thought out a policy, having discussed it with the board, and senior management understanding how you're going to approach this is still, to me, a prerequisite of having an effective program. And just, just another thing to add to that, that to have an effective MRI program, you need good product. And so you need good investments that are actually focused on mission, that are attractive to foundations from a mission standpoint, from a return standpoint. And I think the difference over the last, you know, five, seven, ten, whatever, <laughs> to Josh's uh, <laughs> continuum. We don't know how long this has been happening, but we've seen more and more people on the investment side start thinking about mission as important. And so, Matt, to get back to where you started about this dialogue and how the this is a, just another, you know, log on the fire that says, hey, we're paying attention to impact investing. We're seeing more people, and even in the White House announcement, you're seeing more nod to the for-profit sector about what they're doing to bring good mission impact into the investment vehicles that foundations can review. And so I think that it makes the time ripe, and it, it makes it easier for fiduciaries to do the things that Josh is talking about, the principle, measured approach, et cetera, et cetera, when they have good product and when they have people who are serious about mission on the investment side, no matter how much it is. It can be small, it can be large. But, but it comes through, and I think that's very helpful. And finding that product and matching demand and supply is critical, too. Yep, this is Ruth, and, and I just want to reiterate, I really appreciate these guys focused on the prudence. I mean, that's really at the center of this. Is the, the foundation managers are in the best position to be able to look at all the relevant, all the relevant circumstances and weigh, weigh them up and make the necessary trade-offs. It doesn't change. This doesn't change any of the background rules, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention things like self-dealing and things like uh, private benefit and, and, and private enormous are still out there and are still guide rails. And so being prudent, even though this is a mission investing has become uh, a lot more talked about and people are focusing on it, uh, that's a great thing, and I think it's great if foundations can be uh, can do more with the resources that they have and get more impact out of everything that they do. But of course, you've got to be prudent and, and keep in mind all the other the other things you have to do. And let me um, pull in some questions. We have a lot of questions uh, pouring in from folks uh, on the webinar. Um, first, uh, there's a question from uh, Rosalie Sheehy Cates of the Giving Practice, basically following up whether the question is, is the, the prudence question in the hands of the foundation manager? 
and, and how much does the foundation need to show um, that the investment decision is closely tied to the specific language of their mission or charitable purpose? Uh, what, how close does that nexus need to be? And who makes that decision? So this is, I'll start and others can join, jump in. Um, you know, I think at the heart of it is it's, if you're looking at the standard, and looking at the the relationship, the special relationship to the purposes of the foundation, you're going to look at what the foundation sees as its purposes. You start with the certificate of incorporation, you move to the mission statement, you move to the programs, and so on and so forth. So when I look at this, and when I've been advising public charities that do this under state law, what we like to say is, you know, have a principled approach to it. When just don't say, oh, this is a great mission-related investment. Tell me why. Get it into the investment committee's deliberation or whoever's reviewing it. That there should be documentation. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to spend, you know, days and days pulling together tons of documents, but there should be a program. There should be a rationale that you have. And you should get it into the minutes of the deliberation or the summary of the investment. Whereas before, if we're just looking at someone recommending an investment, there might be an investment summary, an investment statement, why this is a good investment, why it's not you should incorporate some of the mission aspects to it if that's a, an important aspect of what you're doing here. So I think every foundation is going to be different and every organization is going to have a process that they're going to want to follow, but incorporating the mission, the reason into the, into the deliberation is going to be important. And foundations hopefully know what they think their mission is. And again, sometimes the mission falls, you know, evolves over time. But if you could look at the totality of what the foundation is doing, and see how it's carrying out what it believes its purposes and mission are, and then make the argument that this investment fits in to that for whatever reason, then I think that should be sufficient and it should go into the deliberation. I'm not at the IRS and I don't do enforcement in any particular facts and situations, but I, um, I think it's helpful when you're, when you're going into a transaction or an investment decision uh, to think about what someone coming along, you know, a year or two or three later um, might see and, and try to put yourself in their shoes in trying to figure out how, how can you um, document what you're doing at the time you're doing it to make it clear when someone looks at it later what you did and why. And I would just say that I'm not an expert on what we use the, the, the acronym UPMIFA, which we described before, but one of the criteria there is the asset special relationship to the purposes and mission of the fund. So, you know, I'd pay attention to that language because under the state law rules, you know, that's, a, that's the criteria that allows for consideration of the mission. So I think to Tomer's point, you, you want to have a rationale and a criteria for doing it. And I think it should, you know, it, it should be related to what the particular foundation, charitable organization is doing rather than simply any purpose. But I think consult your counsel would be a good guide mark uh, on this one. Yeah, and just, just an important point here is that even though we've been talking about this notion of prudence as aligned in state law and federal law, these are two separate regulatory regimes here. And the, as, as I think it's come up a couple of times, by aligning them has been helpful, but this is something that foundations were subject to regardless. The federal is an overlay on top of that. So you, when you think about this, or a public charity that, that was subject to this, it wasn't subject to 4944, but it was subject to UPMIFA, it always had to do this when it made impact investments. And I think that's, as you're going back through your deliberations, remembering that the federal, this pronouncement doesn't get you out of state law. Um, by aligning it with state law, it makes the conversation easier, but there are two different regulatory regimes to accomplish different purposes. We've raised what uh, this particular notice uh, applies to private foundations. Uh, for clarification, we have several questions um, from, from participants, including uh, Lisa Richter, who is uh, at our Mission Investing Institute. Uh, does this guidance have any implications for community foundations? And maybe, Ruth, first, in terms of the letter of the notice, and then uh, perhaps, Tomer, you could discuss how, in practice, it may impact community foundations. Well, by its terms, the notice is not addressed to public charities. It only applies to 
private foundations because private foundations are the only ones that are subject to the excise tax on jeopardizing investments. And that's where this whole discussion arises. You, you have an excise tax on a private foundation that jeopardizes the carrying out of its purposes by making a jeopardizing investment. This talks about what wouldn't be a jeopardizing investment for those private foundations, but it doesn't have literally an impact on anyone not subject to that, that regulatory regime. And, and to the point I was making a few minutes ago, community foundations, depending on how they're organized under state law, will have that state law, whether it's the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, which is the uniform law applicable to corporations, which has standards for the investment of institutional funds that we've been referring to throughout, or um, the Uniform, I, I don't do a lot of trust work, but it's UPI, Uniform Prudent Investment Act, which is the, the Uniform Act applicable to trusts, which has more variation in how it was adopted by the states. And so you would have to check under state law, but by and large, the community foundations that were corporations were already subject to the same kind of prudence um, standard because of the state law that said you could take into consideration the assets, the special relationship of the asset to the charitable purposes. So, you know, for community foundations and other public charities, you look to state law for the, for the investment um, criteria and what you can and can't do. And in most states, particularly on the corporate side, this standard already existed. Uh, another question um, from our participants, Ken Merritt asks, does the form of the organization receiving the investment uh, matter uh, with regard to this guidance? Uh, that is, um, can a foundation make an investment in a for-profit company, uh, benefit corporation and, and, and L3C, even uh, perhaps a non-profit uh, that is revenue generating, uh, are there any limitations on the type of actual investment under in play here? Ruth, do you want to start? Well, under, under federal, like under our federal tax statutes, there's not a particular investment statute for public charities as opposed to private foundations. There's not an analog to 4944. You've got, um, of course, a lot of the, the regulation of, of tax exempts is at the state level, and that's where you've got the similarity. And so when we look at then, if we look at flipping over to the idea of what are you investing in? 4944 on the jeopardizing investment rules was really targeting investments. And so investments can take many different forms. Um, it can be an investment in a company buying stock. It can be an investment in a fund. It can be an investment in an L3C, which was, which is, um, a, or a benefit corporation, which are all taxable corporations. It could be, you know, a loan to a nonprofit. And so when we look at the investment, we care less about what the thing, the, the, the form of the thing we're investing in is necessarily, but the fact that it is an investment and that by putting our money into this thing, whatever it is, that and it's not a charitable activity, so it's not um, a grant, it's not a direct charitable expense, it's not a PRI, we're giving money to a for-profit or something else for a different purpose, for an investment purpose. And the structure matters less in that context. It's the intent of what we're doing, namely that we're investing. Once we're investing, we're subject to the prudent investment standard. Because again, we, could, we know that a private foundation can decide to spend down. It can make grants for charitable purposes, which doesn't have a return. And that's all OK. What we know we can't do is we can't just give our money to, to private parties without a charitable return to it. And so then we have to look at that and say, OK, this is an investment. Now I'm governed by the investment rules. What are they? And these, the conversation we've been having has been around prudence about deploying your money into these vehicles for the purpose of investment and return, not for program purposes. Uh, Ruth, we, we've received a few questions. Um, you had noted how you do not, you, you work at Treasury and not for IRS enforcement. And I think uh, folks just could use a clarification on um, kind of who puts out this notice and how it impacts how uh, the IRS would then interpret what foundations are doing in this space. 
Great. Okay. And I apologize. I, I agreed completely with, with Tomer on that last one. I, I had missed the, the import of the question. But on this one, uh, Treasury and the IRS work together on guidance. The IRS has the sole um, responsibility for administering the tax code, and that means looking at the law, uh, and I mean that broadly, the law and the guidance, the statutes, the regulations, the revenue procedures, all of the guidance out there, and applying it to a particular taxpayer's facts and circumstances. We at Treasury and the Office of Tax Policy have a, a more uh, a policy-related view of things. We don't look at individual taxpayer facts and circumstances. We're sitting back and looking at the rules and, uh, and, and thinking about what are the right rules and, and, and what are the policy calls that need to be made. And a lot of times in the area of tax, uh, policy and administration overlap. Uh, you can't I can't think of a single situation that we've had in doing guidance where the administration isn't an important factor because of whatever rules we write have to be able to be applied in individual circumstances. But uh, so whenever we're doing guidance, uh, like regulations or like this notice, we're working together with the IRS, the chief counsel, their lawyers, as well as the operational folks that are actually boots on the ground doing determinations and examinations, and we work together to draft the guidance. And when we put it out, it becomes part of this body of guidance that the IRS can then apply in the particular facts and circumstances of each individual non-taxpayer. Thanks. Uh, Tomer, do you, do you want to follow up on that at all in terms of uh, how um, a foundation moving in this space should think about their relationship to the IRS as they're, as they're uh, putting these uh, prudent investment policies together that may include investments that are uh, connected to their mission? Sure. I mean, we, we always think about, we have a body of, of rules out there that, that govern how we act as in the nonprofit sector, whether you're a private foundation or a public charity. Um, Ruth mentioned a few earlier about the private foundation excise taxes, the self-dealing, taxable expenditures, jeopardizing investments we've been talking about. But at the heart of everything we're doing, when we, when we think about compliance in the sector, we think about what the rules are, how we comply, how we document internally that we're complying when necessary, and then ultimately if someone is going to look and ask are we complying, it's going to be the IRS in an audit context. Sometimes you have, you know, other factors coming in. What, you know, you have state attorney generals, whether it's in, in the context of state law. You sometimes have, you know, Congress coming in and looking at nonprofits. But in general, when we're thinking about 4944 and these rules that we're talking about as it relates to jeopardizing investments and compliance, we're thinking about how this will look to the IRS if they ever audit us. And, you know, Ruth's point earlier about the documentation and how it would look to somebody in the future. Um, oftentimes when we think about it, that somebody is an IRS auditor that's sitting down and asking questions about what you're doing, whether it's a PRI and how is this a PRI, whether it's an, a mission-related investment and why is it a mission-related investment. And the best thing, the best advice that I ever got, the best advice I think I ever give is that if you document contemporaneously what you're doing and just say it out loud, sometimes we forget to do that. Say it out loud, put it into the documentation, into the record that we have. When someone re asks a question later and you pull out an investment memo that takes into account mission and impact, they'll read it and say, you know what, that makes sense. Presumably it's reasonable, presumably it's well documented. And so that's really what we're shooting for here when we think about compliance and potential IRS enforcement is that you don't have to explain yourself later because your contemporaneous documentation, your process explained why you did it then and they and they it, it it makes you know an a reviewer happy to see that you thought about these things in this area compliance is really about mission and if you're documenting mission well then and you're not doing things that are you know self you know conflicts of interest and self dealing that should come out i i, I second that wholeheartedly i second that wholeheartedly because they and, and in this scenario I, I think it's important to to note there's not a magic format or particular formula you have to follow. I, I, you know, it doesn't have to be 40 pages long at, at, at all times. If it's, 
I think it, it needs to be reasonable given the size of the investment and, and the trade-offs that you're making. If you're making an investment where you're shaving off maybe 100 basis points, but it's clearly feeding hungry children, then it may be, you may be able to, and you're, you're putting in you know, $500,000 of a $5 billion portfolio, maybe you can document that you know, quickly in a few bullet points. If you're putting in an enormous percentage of your, uh, of your portfolio, and there's a significant trade-off between uh, the, the charitability and the financial return. Well, I, I think that will draw a lot more questions. And potentially, it, if this doesn't go as hoped, if this goes poorly, then you're going to be explaining it in a situation of having lost a lot of money, potentially. And, and having a little documentation there of what you were expecting at the time you were expecting it, um, I think makes a lot of sense. And Matt, I was just going to add that in the context of all of what Tom and Ruth said, that's exactly right. The other thing that many foundations and other organizations worry about is their reputation. So a lot of this goes to issues of being thoughtful and, and you know, it's not only headline IRS risk, it's headline risk and it's about you know, you're putting a substantial part of your endowment into something and it, you don't get the impact and you don't get the return, you know, there's a whole reputation aspect of it that a lot of organizations are, I think, justifiably concerned about. Great. Well, we um, have run out of time. Um, this has been an extraordinarily robust and helpful conversation. And I want to thank uh, Ruth and Tomer and Josh uh, for all of their insights today. Um, I know that the members of Mission Investors Exchange and the Council of Foundations, as well as uh, all the other participants, uh, have really enjoyed this conversation and learned a lot. Um, we appreciate your time and, and effort and uh, look forward to more conversations with all of you online in the near future. Uh, thank you all so much for joining today. Uh, the webinar is now concluded, and we will be closing the platform. Thanks again. Thank you.